Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chancellor, Ms. Walton, distinguished guests, citizens of the communities of Northwest Arkansas, students and colleagues, welcome to the Housing Northwest Arkansas Regional Symposium convened today in Bentonville and tomorrow on the University of Arkansas campus in Fayetteville. My name is Peter McKeith, Dean of the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design at the University of Arkansas, and it's my privilege to serve as the symposium's guide for these events. Let's begin with an invocation and a challenge. Here's the invocation. Architecture may not be able to save the world, but perhaps it can set the world a small example. And here's the challenge, that of accessible, affordable, and attainable housing, announced on the one hand as an issue of national importance just last week through the annual Menino Survey of Mayors, in which a majority of the nation's mayors indicated that their primary concern was a lack of such housing in their cities. And on the other hand, announced last week here in Northwest Arkansas as a local and regional issue through a study compiled by the Center for Business and Economic Research at the Walton College of Business, indicating a need for more accessible housing options in Benton and Washington counties. Housing Northwest Arkansas is an initiative led by the Faye Jones School made possible by a grant from the Walton Family Foundation. As we begin, I'd like to express my gratitude to all at the Walton Family Foundation for this partnership, for their support, and for our shared belief in the potentials of architecture and design to address these challenges. The Housing Northwest Arkansas Initiative includes an advanced design studio focused on the education of students, a regional symposium focused on the education of the community, and a professional design competition focused on the tangible realization of the ideas explored through education into a productive reality. The design studio began three weeks ago in our school under the guidance of visiting Professor Ann Fujiron, a nationally renowned architect in housing design, Kent McDonald, also renowned in, his, in this field at Cal Poly SLO, and our own Carl Matthews, Head of Interior Design, and Allison Turner of the Architecture Faculty. They are joined today by many of the students in that studio. The competition process, jury, and participants will be announced on March 1st, and we look forward to a very healthy competition process. But each of these components adds to the in-depth exploration of national and regional housing issues of design, zoning, finance, city planning, community development, and community education and engagement. This weekend's symposium will include presentations by national experts and a series of public presentations and moderated discussions on housing policy, finances, design development, and construction. The symposium aims to provide all participants here and tomorrow with an overview of the issues and the challenges and the design exemplars in attainable, affordable, and mixed-use housing. I'll alert all present to our desire for your participation here in discussion today and through social media, through the channels shown here. If I could have that slide, please. We have a hashtag HousingNWA. In this context today, for our keynote presentations and discussions, we welcome to Northwest Arkansas, the Honorable Sean Donovan, the former Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and as well, we're privileged to include Mr. Darren Walker, President of the Ford Foundation. But first, there are two regional perspectives that are important to share, that of the University of Arkansas and that of the Walton Family Foundation. In succession, I'll first ask Chancellor Joseph Steinmetz of the University and then Karen Minkle, Home Region Director of the Walton Family Foundation, to the podium for their framing thoughts. Chancellor Steinmetz arrived now almost three years ago from the Ohio State University uh, and has been a staunch supporter of the School of Architecture and Design as well as a very devoted community leader already. He speaks in a dual role, both from the university's perspective and that of the Northwest Arkansas Council. He's currently leading the university in its eight guiding priorities. Karen Minkle, who you'll hear then next, uh, is a community servant of broad and deep experience. 
uh, beginning first with Teach for America in Harlem and continuing on to work with the city of Fayetteville uh, in there as a director of strategic planning. And she now oversees uh, so many initiatives for the Walton Family Foundation, it's hard to keep count. But first, if I could ask Joe Steinmetz and then Karen Minkle, <laughs> Chancellor. Thank you, Dean McKeith. Uh, I want to begin by uh, providing a shout out, I think, to uh, Dean McKeith and, and to the Faye Jones uh, School of Architecture and Design. This is an innovative school, particularly in the areas of sustainability and resilience. And we're very, very proud of what's going on in that school. And it's due to the leadership of Peter. So thank you very much, Peter. Um, as both Chancellor of the University of Arkansas, and I'm also serving this year as the presiding co-chair of the Northwest Arkansas Council. I want to make sure I first welcome everybody to this great event. And I also want to extend a warm welcome to today's uh, keynote speaker, Mr. Sean Donovan. We're so glad uh, to have you here today. It's going to be a great discussion all weekend long. Uh, we owe particular thanks to the Walton uh, Family Foundation for their support and their partnership in this and all of the other ways that they've impacted the University of Arkansas and impacted this region. We're blessed that you call this home, so thank you very much. If I'm representing both the University and the Northwest Arkansas Council today, it's in recognition that the fortunes of this region and the university are too deeply intertwined and too, uh, too uh, intertwined to disentangled. This is an exciting time for both, and the betterment of one and certainly extends to the betterment of the other. And just as the university has seen very significant growth in the, over the last decade, we've added 10,000 students to our population, so too has the Northwest Arkansas Metroplex grown, almost proportionally the same. Certainly, having a major research university, in my opinion, that calls the region home has contributed to the appeal and to the attractiveness of this area. And the university is strongly committed to its land-grant mission, we are a land-grant university, to benefit the cultural, the environmental, the developmental, and the economic uh, areas of the development of the region and of the state. And in that capacity, we've been a critical partner in the re uh, region's emergence as a major economic and a major cultural force. But success is not without some challenges, particularly when it inspires rapid growth like we've had here. Housing in this region has been, can become a critical issue for all our citizens and stakeholders, and of particular concern is affordable and attainable housing. As a university, this is, of course, of great interest to us since we have a large student population for whom a college education is already a financial stretch. For example, many of our graduate students who are here sometimes for four to six years, and many of them have families, and they have very few options right now. We need to ensure that they can afford to have a roof over their heads as well, especially students who already have families. So the university is pleased to address this issue uh, productively through applied thought, through work, and through outreach of its schools and its colleges, outreach that's exemplified by this very symposium. And I believe that collaboration is key to the advancement of mutual benefits, and I greatly appreciate your interest in coming together to discuss this very vital and important subject. And I look very much forward to seeing what progress and outcomes result. Again, thanks to the Walton Family Foundation and its role in facilitating this necessary and important exchange. And everybody have a pleasant time here. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor, and thank you, Dean McKeith. And thank you to the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design for your partnership and leadership in this initiative. You know, I was thinking today that it's a beautiful day in Bentonville when you are literally choosing between Sean Donovan and Darren Walker and Faith Ringgold at Crystal Bridges. It's, it's not too shabby. And I want to commend everyone in the room and really everyone in the region for coming together to talk about the Northwest Arkansas housing landscape. You know, just this past week, hundreds of people gathered in Bentonville and Springdale to talk about attainable housing needs in their, their downtowns. And this conversation involved architects, artists, mayors, developers, 
and people from the financial sector, all of whom talked about the needs and identified possible solutions. And just two days ago, as Dean McKeith mentioned, the Walton Family Foundation released a study conducted by the Center for Business and Economic Research that measured the vitality in our downtowns. And for those of us who live here, the results weren't a surprise. It showed that the populations are growing and development is strong, and that the cultural offerings and trails and green space that have been constructed by municipalities and many partners across the region are creating a quality of life that is incredibly desirable. But we know that this vitality is also directly related to the diversity of people in that community. And increasing the desirability of our downtowns also increases the demand for housing. And the report also highlighted some early trends such as rising residential costs and the close to 0% vacancy when it comes to multifamily dwellings that suggest that the accessibility of downtown living may be increasingly limited to those who have higher incomes. And as Dean McKeith mentioned, this issue is not unique to Northwest Arkansas. Mayors across the country, whether they're from the coast or the south, big cities, small cities, they're all grappling with attainable housing issues. But where we can be unique is that we can thoughtfully think about this issue and address the problem before we reach a crisis point. When we talk with leaders from aspirational cities, whether it's Minneapolis or Austin, and we ask them, what are the things you wish you'd done two decades ago? They all say two things, transportation and attainable housing. And we are at an inflection point that really represents a challenge and an opportunity for our region. And for the past two years, we've been ranked among the top five places to live in the US. And it's a list where we're typically competing with cities that are no longer accessible to everyone. And replicating the amenities that we see in other peer cities doesn't make us unique. But if we can double down on our commitment to access and equity, I think it makes us stand out and could even propel us to the number one spot. So thank you all for coming this afternoon, and I hope to see you tomorrow as well. Thank you both. I want to offer a third framework before asking uh, Mr. Donovan to the podium, and that's the framework uh, of the School of Architecture and Design. Many know we're composed of professional programs in architecture, landscape architecture, and interior design. Others might also know we have a 70-year history of excellence in professional architecture and design education, as well as a history of contributions, as the Chancellor has said, to the cultural, environmental, and economic development of the state. We are the only school of such professional programs in the state, and our obligation, therefore, is to the state. The work of our alumni and our faculty has extended this dual legacy throughout the region, the nation, and internationally. And this is now the platform for our work in the school today, whereby our collaborative emphasis in architecture and design prepares our students to address issues of imperative value for the state, the nation, and the world. Currently, we're working across multiple fronts of design territory, resiliency and sustainable design, community design, preservation design, healthcare design, and design in mass timber and wood products all on the basis of identified areas of immediate design value to the citizens of the state and transferable for value for our graduates wherever they choose to go, here and elsewhere in the world. Housing design is equally a design territory in which we believe the school can contribute to the regional and national conversation for the betterment of our society. Our Community Design Center, under the direction of Professor Stephen Luoni and working with Professor Kevin Fitzpatrick in Fayetteville, is working to address the needs of homeless communities, as well as the Willow Heights neighborhood in Fayetteville. We're also pleased to work with the Walton Family Foundation to examine these issues more comprehensively for the region and with a specific design focus this semester on Bentonville. Together with many on our faculty and with our students, we're working to set those important small examples. And it is in this context of an education in architecture and design and in the cause of housing that our keynote speaker today is exceedingly appropriate. For 
Trained in both architecture and public administration at Harvard, Sean Donovan is the embodiment of the architect as advocate, the architect as public servant, the architect engaged with challenges in the political and social arenas, the architect passionately and persistently devoted to housing in the United States. Now, his biography is there to be found on our website. I won't go through the list of titles and accomplishments. I will say that if you go deeper, you will find on the internet uh, an interview with Sean's sister, who's a psychiatrist, and who describes her brother as, quote, a malignant optimist. That is, that's what we all want to be, I think. And I think it's perhaps congenitally so for those in architecture and design. Mr. Donovan is therefore an ideal candidate to initiate our discussions. Following his opening remarks, he'll be joined on stage by Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation for further dialogue and for audience questions. Ladies and gentlemen, to the cause of housing of Northwest Arkansas, please welcome Sean Donovan. Peter, first of all, thank you for such uh, an incredibly kind introduction. Um, and I plead guilty to the malignant optimism. It has turned out to be completely incurable, despite uh, many years of public service. And uh, I want to say in particular thank you for your leadership for today and more broadly this initiative that you've, you've put together. Um, as somebody, and you said this, trained as an architect, it is the power of design to help people visualize and see things and then to build them that they could only imagine. And that is what this task is, I think, in front of all of you. And hopefully, uh, I can be a little bit of help today. So thank you for your leadership. Um, let me say thank you to the Walton Foundation, uh, Alice, and all of you that are, that are here today for your incredible leadership. Uh, look at this space that we're in. Look at what has happened here and more broadly across the region thanks to the leadership. It gives me a great deal of hope that this enormously ambitious uh, idea that brings us together today is something that you can help lead uh, and to make reality, to be the designers of that future. And so thank you as well. And um, let me just uh, take the opportunity to call out and uh, recognize my close friend and somebody who I admire enormously, Darren Walker. Uh, many of you may not know that Darren is himself uh, an expert, uh, we, would, we would say in the business, a hauser. Um, he started a, uh, what has become a magnificent career, one of the leading voices uh, for justice and equality really around the world, began uh, in housing in Harlem, in New York City. And we had the great pleasure to work together there. Uh, we've worked together on many, many things uh, since then over the years. And it gives me great pleasure to be here today with you and to hopefully get quickly to a conversation about these things that are so close to your heart. So let's give a round to Darren Walker for being here as well. So you know how they say every talk should begin with a joke. And if I were going to begin this uh, with a joke, it would go something like, Two guys from New York walk into an old newspaper in downtown Bentonville, Arkansas, and try to tell the locals how to develop their community, right? Um, doesn't sound like a very promising joke, but I'm actually going to make it worse by talking about the South Bronx and the New York Yankees. So see, no laughs. <laughs> I do this work because I grew up in the New York City that all of us have seen in movies, uh, all of us have read about. It was the South Bronx that was burning. And literally as an 11-year-old, I was at the 1977 World Series 
where Howard Cosell, how many people in, in the audience even know who Howard Cosell is? There you go. Where Howard Cosell allegedly, I was at the game, and you know, there's some dispute about this, but allegedly told millions of uh, TV viewers across the country that the Bronx was burning. Um, I saw those fires. I watched as that neighborhood around Yankee Stadium lost 75% of its population in just a decade. Think about that. I watched as Harlem burned. Um, so much so that the agency that I ran in New York City uh, many years later, at that time, 60% of all the real estate in Harlem was owned by my agency, by the city of New York. And we started renovating those, those uh, beautiful brownstones and selling them for a dollar. That was the New York I grew up in. And it was, uh, the, the South Bronx was, the city of New York was the poster child for what urban theorists were saying was the death of the American city, that we were literally watching uh, the beginning of what would be a trend that uh, the cities across the US were on their way out, that they were dying. Why do I tell this story? Because it seems to me that one of the challenges you have that brings you together today is to Imagine, and as I think a number of uh, folks just said, to see a future that is not yet here and to motivate people across the region to react, to make difficult decisions, to plan in response to something that seems remote. You're beginning to see the pressures of unaffordable housing. You're beginning to see these challenges that come with success, but they are not yet here. And for me, the Bronx is the best example because when I go back to the South Bronx today, I see a completely different community. Literally in those same lots where the fires that Howard Cosell talked about, there are market rate condominiums going up. In places where the first effort to build affordable housing was to build uh, small houses on quarter acre lots because nobody ever believed people would come back to the South Bronx. Those houses are surrounded now by 10, 15 story towers and life is teeming in the South Bronx. Many, many challenges still. In, in fact, the challenges of, of success uh, and people moving back that come uh, with that, increasing pressures on affordability and all those things. But my point is that we tend to think of our cities as static. We tend to think of our communities as static. In fact, they change radically and dramatically in the scope of a few decades. And so for all of you, I think it is, uh, what I wanna try to do is help imagine a future that could be a, a, a brighter one, but also to, to think about what are the consequences that come with uh, not making the right decisions, not thinking about that future, not taking on those choices right now. The other reason I raise it is because that transformation that has happened in the South Bronx is actually part of a national trend that has led to us, you could call it rediscovering our cities, but this is an urban moment in our history. And I think those trends are not ones that will change quickly. Those trends are ones that I think will shape this region and successful regions across the country for decades to come. What are those trends? Well, first of all, we have a fundamental shift in our economy. We have moved from an economy based on industry to an economy based on information. And it used to be that cities were good places because they were located on a port, on a river, on a railroad line, because they had access to the raw materials that went into steel mills or other things that drove our economy. And basically, we looked for where 
those raw materials were, those, those physical and other advantages, companies located there, and people and workers followed. In this new economy, that equation is being reversed. More and more, when the workplace is, is not the factory, but that work is taking place in our minds, in our computers, there is an enormous flexibility, particularly for the intellectual capital that is driving this new economy, for people to choose where to locate, and companies and capital follow. And that is a fundamental shift in what is driving the success of cities. At the same time, we've reached or close to reach the limits of the automobile geography. If you think about what led to the hollowing out of, of many of our cities, it was uh, a spreading of our population because of the ability of the automobile to allow us to reach places out in nature, places that were cheaper uh, for housing. But we're really beginning to reach the limits of that. And in many places, frankly, we've, we've gone well beyond those, those limits. Um, but finally, and I think this ties to, to both those points, that as workers, uh, at least those who have the, uh, whether it's a university degree or the skills that allow them to compete and succeed in this economy, and many don't, but as, as those workers have more freedom to choose where they locate, they are choosing places less and less based on uh, old, ways of looking at cities, and more and more on quality of life. That was exactly what you just, we, we were just hearing about this region. The importance of all of those advantages, being one of the best places to live, is an enormous driver of economic development today. And, and what is important for civic leaders, uh, elected officials, more and more is to think about how you enhance that advantage. And I like to say that more and more placemaking is economic development. That if you can build a place where people want to live, where workers will come, you can build an economic advantage that is very, very powerful. And in my work, uh, I worked for, for Mike Bloomberg, uh, mayor in New York, for five years. I've worked with mayors across the, the country as HUD secretary. More and more what I, thought, I saw is that the most innovative mayors were really thinking about placemaking, about creating quality of life as a way to drive economic development. And if you think about those trends, it immediately leads you to understand the powerful advantages that you have here. You obviously have uh, enormously sec successful companies already here, but you also have a power, powerful driver of attracting intellectual capital, uh, you have a university, and, and other institutions here that can help continue to attract and build the intellectual capital that is the raw material of today's economy. And you have incredible natural uh, gifts in terms of the beauty of your landscape, but also look around this downtown. People want a place that feels authentic, that doesn't feel like it could be anywhere else in the country or anywhere else in the world. And those advantages pos position you incredibly well in these broader trends that we're seeing towards rediscovery and redevelopment uh, of center cities, of greater density, of having options to walk or bike or, or do a range of things that haven't traditionally been available in, in too many of our uh, environments that we built around the country. So that, I think, is, is the good news. But I want to go back to the point I made at the beginning about imagining where the future could lead. And we see, I've seen, uh, across this country, and in fact, across the world, that as cities flourish, there are downsides that if you don't pay attention to them, they can actually undermine the very success that has led to the growth uh, of, of your communities, of your cities, of your towns. First of all, it's rising housing costs. Quite simply, if 
you can't attract and keep the range of workers that are critical to driving your economy, and by the way, teaching your kids in school, uh, treating your patients at your hospitals, the, the, the broad range of jobs that are necessary for a healthy, strong community, if they can't, if those folks can't live in your community, it's gonna be hard to, to be, continue to be successful uh, over a, a long period of time. But one thing that I think is really important to think about is not just housing costs in isolation, but the combination of housing and transportation costs. One of the things I found fascinating, this region is actually quite affordable at this point. Your, your average family spends about 26% of their income on housing. That's actually better than most places. But the average family in this region spends 29% of their income on transportation. Remarkable. More than 50% higher than the average in the United States. And those are the two biggest costs for a family. And when you have a combination of families spending 55% of their income on housing and transportation combined, you have a recipe for real, uh, real problems going forward if that's not something that you can attack and deal with. And particularly as the region grows and succeeds and it's gonna be harder to uh, buy an affordable place to live that you know, maybe is a half hour drive, maybe it becomes an hour, or that is going to really challenge the ability to solve these problems. And that's why you have to think about these issues and attack these issues of housing and transportation in a combined way. The other thing I think is critical goes back to the point I was making earlier. This incredible, authentic character of what makes this region so special, one of the five best places to live in, in the US, how is it possible to maintain that character? Too often what we see is that unplanned sprawl leads to a leveling of placelessness, of places that could be anywhere and that no longer feel like what you grew up with, what attracted you here. And fundamentally, what that means is that you have to figure out how to bring together very disparate interests. Those who care about downtown, those who care about farms and uh, environmentalists who may think about uh, preserving the incredible natural beauty that you have and find ways to plan that don't just level that, but in fact enhance and uh, make even stronger those differences within this region so that you're actually building on what makes you an authentic and special community. And that's something that is hard to do. Those types of conversations, uh, that kind of planning it is enormously complex. It is time consuming. Um, it is political in the small p sense of bringing lots of different disparate voices together, but it's absolutely central in order to reach success. And the last piece, which is related to all this, is that the problem of success that we see in so many cities and could be on the horizon for this region if you don't attack it, is the growing inequality and really hopelessness for those at the lowest end of the economic ladder to be able to succeed. Because it goes without saying that higher housing costs, higher transportation costs fall the heaviest on those who have the least. And already this region has the greatest range of inequality within the state. I think I saw 33 times the top 1% earns relative uh, to the bottom. And so the consequences of that can be dramatic if it's something that you don't take on and take on early. As, as was said earlier, you have an opportunity early on in this process to really attack these problems it will be cheaper, more effective to do it now. But if you don't, what it can lead to is challenges that so many of our urban areas 
have seen. If you think about the crime and uh, other traditional urban challenges that have now spread to, to many parts uh, of, of this country, if you think about the hopelessness, and frankly, more and more what we're seeing is these aren't just challenges for those who get left behind. If you look at our national economy, more and more as we see places that are, have the highest costs, no longer can lower income, less skilled people move to those regions and get access to where we're generating jobs. And that's not just a problem for those low income families or the less skilled families, that's a problem for our national economy. Um, perhaps the best example is in California where uh, a recent study showed that about three points of their gross domestic product, their GDP, has been cut by the inability to attract lower skilled, lower income people to be able to take those jobs and to, and to gain skills and to grow in, that, in those regions. And so that is also uh, a significant piece of this that uh, is important as you think about that potential future and plan for it. I don't want to be too dark. Uh, I am a malignant optimist. So let me close by where I began. You've been brought together by the design school to imagine a future. That is what designers do. They take the hopes, the imaginings of, of people, and give them reality. They make them real. And that is what I hope this process can be today. And as you move forward in the weeks and months ahead. I'm excited to watch. I'm here to help in whatever way I can. And I look forward to a discussion with Peter and Darren about strategies that can help make that real. So thank you. Slight stage management here. Deans do many things, among them moving furniture. <laughs> and if you could take your seat here. Right. Could I ask Mr. Walker to join us here? And I'm also going to ask my colleague, Professor Luoni from the CDC, to also assist us in our question and answer. And I think we need some microphones. Is this on? Yeah. It's all on. So uh, I've asked Steve to, in fact, pose the first question. And uh, actually, the first answer goes to Darren. Oh, yeah. Uh, first question goes to Darren Walker. Uh, you heard Sean Donovan talk about the risk and challenges that go with a region's success, uh, like ours, as, as, particularly as the region grows in prosperity. And you yourself have uh, devoted your career to championing. Um, populations in similar distress, particularly uh, low-income populations have been marginalized by market forces or political forces. Uh, what can you re reflect on why that's important for all of us to think about, and what kind of actions can we take uh, to address these issues? Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. It's a great honor to be with my friend Sean Donovan anywhere. So actually, Sean, we're both New Yorkers, but my experience is informed by my own experience with housing. So which are really, I think, three different phases of my life. I actually am from the South. I grew up, I was born in a small town in Louisiana, and I grew up in a small town in Texas and, and in communities that were highly segregated and then I went to Austin, Texas for college. And I saw, as Karen said, what happened in Austin three decades ago when voters repeatedly turned down bond issues on transportation and on housing. And I was in Austin recently, and it took me almost an hour to get from the university to downtown because the traffic was just 
it, it, takes, it took longer than it takes to get from Midtown to Wall Street, okay? I mean, it was really horrific. And I thought, what has happened to this town? This is not the, the jewel of a, of a university town that I attended. And then I live in a city like New York, and I spend my weekends out in the Hamptons where people who work in the Hamptons don't live in the Hamptons. People who weekend in the Hamptons live in the Hamptons, but the people who actually do the work don't live there. And what I find as I look and reflect to your question is that this is about leadership. The intervention that is needed is leaders like Sean and Mike Bloomberg and mayors, first mayors. If you, and this is why my, my argument is to do all you can to elect great leaders, to nourish and nurture those leaders in their communities and help them step forward and be courageous because it takes courage to do this. The second, because this community, Northwest Arkansas, whether you want it to be or not, is going to be successful. So you guys are where Austin was. I mean, there was, there was no way Austin was not going to be successful. It had all the ingredients. This region has all the ingredients to be successful. You have a great economy which undergirds everything. It is a destination. You have assets. You have a great land-grant university. You have one of America's greatest art museums in this, in this little town. And this is one of the world's great art museums. You have all kinds of assets. So you're going to be successful. The question is how you define success. If you define success as inclusive, then you may not be a successful place. You may be a place like the Hamptons or Aspen or all these places where the people who live and work and do the day-to-day, -day, the regular Americans, the people who we ought to care about the most, feel the, the most dispossessed. And so the work that you're all doing here is so much about, about leadership and the convergence of public and private and philanthropy. In every region where there has been positive movement on these issues, you have strong philanthropy. And again, how lucky you are to have the Walton Family Foundation as a risk capital investor in ideas and innovation and things that the public sector may not be willing to or may need a little kick to get engaged in. So the question for you all is, do you want to be an inclusive, successful region? Because you're going to succeed. You're going to succeed. Apologies. No worries. No worries. That's all right. um, following on that, and really this is for both of you, because you've both been engaged in building consensus, in moving the needle, so to speak. When communities try to plan uh, for the future, groups such as downtown businesses, farmers, environmentalists, low-income families, and others have very different interests and points of view. So based on your experiences, how can we in Northwest Arkansas create a planning process that is truly inclusive, comprehensive, and representative? And again, I'll appreciate both of your responses. So first of all, I would just say, in, in my mind, that is the key to getting a comprehensive, visionary plan for the region, is to be able to get everybody to the table and make sure that they have a voice and are actually can see themselves in the solutions that you that you come up with. And I've seen time and time again that plans get made and sit on the shelves when they don't actually have that constituency to, to make them real. Um, I also, building on what Darren said, would really focus on the assets that you have, and in particular to convene those 
uh, people. What I've seen is that it takes either a very unusual and strong leader in a public official like a mayor, uh, or it can be an institution like a university or a foundation that become, if you will, the convening table. There needs to be a table that is seen as objective, as not owned by one of those interests, um, and that has credibility that can bring that group together and start that, that process. And so I think you do have the makings of that uh, as, a, as a possibility. Um, I also think you've got to think very strategically about what are the strange bedfellow issues where uh, you can find ways to get, you know, in, I, I, I did a lot of work in Fresno, California, which is one of the poorest cities in the, in the country. We had a very strong mayor. And it's a, a deeply poor city right next to the most fertile agricultural area in the United States. And yet the land interests and agricultural interests weren't talking to the downtown business interests. And so they convened a process where they actually concentrated and uh, reinvested in, in building up the density in downtown, in part to protect farmland from, from development. And so that mayor found a key issue, a key interest where there was alignment, um, that became the starting point for um, another one was homelessness. Huge homelessness problem, big challenge for, for downtown businesses, but also obviously for the homeless themselves and advocates, uh, many community organizations. And she started to build an alliance ar around that issue. So it's, it's both what's the table, who sets that table, and then it's what's the meal, right? What are the things that you actually come together uh, where there can be an unusual alignment uh, of interests? And I would just say that it's very important for that table to be legitimate. And often people in the community feel like it's illegitimate because it's populated with particular special interests in that community. And issues that are often under the veneer, like race, class, histories in communities, are are ignored, and then when these tables get created, because they're ignored in the larger discourse, they play out in really dysfunctional ways that, uh, that slow things down. I, mean, I have been in situations, I remember once in, in a situation in Harlem when we were trying to uh, do one of those many amazing projects that you wanted, Sean, us to do, um, <laughs> and, it, and it was hard. Right? It was hard because, because at that time, the, when we were giving away brownstones for a dollar, people in Harlem were angry. They were angry because this was a black community in the, practically in the middle of Manhattan that had been left for dead. And all of a sudden, people wanted to move back to their community. And what the city couldn't understand sometimes was why are people trying to stop progress. This is progress. Well, actually, if gentrification becomes equated with displacement, there was, when we were doing a supermarket, the first supermarket to be built in Harlem in 40 years, there was a woman at a community board meeting, I'll never forget, who said, please don't bring this supermarket to Harlem. It was so counterintuitive to me. Harlem was a food desert. And yet she was saying, please don't come. Because to her, that supermarket represented not the beginning of, of a renewal, but the end of her time and people like her in that community. So balancing when you put the table together, having legitimate voices at the table and leadership that can manage through that. And I couldn't agree with you more about the role of philanthropy in so many of the places where we have seen positive progress. Because philanthropy is, is often willing to do things that some people in the public sector can't do, it's so important. It's so important 
that their investment be, uh, be critical. Steve? Yeah, um, you know, following up on that, um, usually in light of market failures to provide affordable housing, we usually look to the public sector. What emerging trends in the nonprofit sector, uh, particularly the philanthropic sector, are there in terms of housing supply, uh, innovations in financing, uh, innovations in planning that both of you foresee uh, occurring? So, um, first of all, don't give up on the public sector. Uh, it, it is not an easy time in terms of resources, uh, particularly federal resources. Um, but I have seen uh, small and medium-sized housing authorities that can be very entrepreneurial, uh, that have essentially become uh, owners and uh, entrepreneurs in their communities attracting a whole di a range of resources, government but otherwise, and really started to, starting to build uh, integrated communities, um, not just for the lowest income, but mixed income in a way that is quite powerful. So I think there are, there are very good examples of that. I would also say, you know, if you look at the broader arc of what's happened, really going back to those days in the South Bronx that I was talking about, more and more, um, Local community development corporations, Darren worked uh, with a community development corporation that was church affiliated in, in Harlem. They have become the drivers of so much of our uh, affordable housing. And so I think it's really important to think about not necessarily do we have existing community organizations that have those skills, because those skills can, can be built, um, but really do they have uh, the right leadership and the right credibility in communities to become those leaders. And then we, we're, we're blessed now to have a, a large set of national nonprofits that both are what we call intermediaries that can, uh, and I know we'll talk about this this weekend, um, tomorrow in the, in the rest of the conference, but where those uh, those organizations can bring in either partnerships, they can be the development partners, they can bring in capital. Uh, many of them bridge sort of from Main Street to Wall Street to bring in capital like tax credits and other things. And so there's a, there's a whole range of resources that you can draw on nationally if you can identify the right community organizations that can really be uh, leaders on this. So I think that's important. The other thing I would say is that uh, uh, the fundamental resources is, are, are enormously important here. And the fundamental job of a successful region that cares about an issue like this is to figure out how to leverage the very success that is creating pressure in order to create the resources for affordable housing. What do I mean by that? In New York City, we used our zoning code uh, because we knew if we upzoned, we were creating enormous value. And what the, the basic deal we made with developers is, look, we're going to upzone. That's going to be good for you. But we're going to require you to set aside some portion of that housing as, as affordable. Um, it's a win-win in that sense, a, you know, uh, overused phrase. But it also has this powerful uh, result of creating the very kind of diversity that... Um, we've been we've been talking about. Well, you know, it was very powerful for me for me driving uh, just a few minutes to to get here. I saw what looked like two French chateaus right next to mobile homes, and everything in between. That's what you want this region to continue to be. That's what you want Bentonville to continue to be. And so, how do you actually leverage the very success? that you're having, many communities have set aside a portion of their property taxes. Um, we did that in New York. We had a, a surcharge essentially on, on property taxes or a piece of the existing property tax that was dedicated to affordable housing. So the more success there is, the more you generate resources to, to reinvest in, in affordable housing. So I think there are many different vehicles to do it, but the key idea is how do we leverage the very success that's creating pressure on affordable housing as resources to build more affordable housing? I would just uh, say that I agree with everything Sean said. And 
what I would say more emphatically than you is that none of this will happen without a robust and vibrant public sector. Philanthropy cannot do the job of government. Not only can we not do it, no one elected us, and we don't have the resources. So the kind of project that Alice was telling me about that you all are doing here on workforce housing that the Walton Family Foundation is jump-starting is exactly the role of philanthropy and the university working together with developers, with architects. But to actually execute at scale is going to take public investment. And you are kidding yourselves if you think you can achieve inclusion by without a government investment and with some competency in government. And that is, I will only tell you, after Katrina, when, when I was at the Rockefeller Foundation, and Sean knows this well because he was engaged after HUD, the, the thing that was the rate limiting issue for us was the lack of capacity in the public sector. Because no matter how much money Rockefeller pl plowed into New Orleans or Gates plowed into, without a public sector that could deliver, we couldn't get our job done. And so I would only implore you to not buy into a narrative that government is bad. We don't want government involvement because that can only lead to bad outcomes. Um, I think is a flawed uh, assumption. And while it's certainly, sure, it's certainly true that uh, government in many instances has not done a good enough job of delivering, to believe we can do this without some mechanism that involves revenue generation, that involves regulation, because the policies that Sean talks about are critical, because it's a market. I mean, we're all capitalists here. We want the market to work. But we also want the market to deliver as much shared prosperity and opportunity for as many of our citizens as possible. And so I love the idea of a French chateau and a mobile home. I lived in a mobile home, so <laughs> I, can only t I didn't live in the French chateau. But what I will tell you is that the notion of diversity the notion that we are not going to become like Venezuela, where rich people all live behind a wall with barbed wire around their community and a gate at the beginning, the front of it, is not America. That's not the country, that's not the nation we want to be. So bravo for mobile homes and French chateaus. <laughs> It, it is so true. And, you know, not to be melodramatic, but look at what's happening in this country today. It, it isn't just an economic divide we're talking about. It's a cultural divide. And we're having a harder and harder time talking across that divide to understand each other. And that's, that's not the future we want either. Both of you, in your remarks and just now in, in one of your responses, identified transportation whether it was H plus T or the anecdote of how difficult it is now to move from UT Austin campus to downtown. So there is a critical question to be addressed, as you've identified, here in Northwest Arkansas about transit and, and in many ways perhaps moving beyond automobile transportation. Are there, is there evidence, again in your experience, to suggest that investment and development of regional transit systems do incentivize, does incentivize housing, affordable housing, accessible housing, attainable housing? So first of all, I would just say, I, I think you are undertaking this process at an incredibly exciting moment to think about these issues for a region like Northwest Arkansas, right? Because Usually you say the word transit, and the first thing that comes to mind is the New York City subway, right? Or uh, light rail, or uh, solutions that don't necessarily, certainly not right now, feel 
like a, a great fit with the way people move and commute or, around a region. But I've just, I, I spent a few days uh, judging a competition that the Bloomberg Foundation put together for uh, innovation grants to cities. We've got cities experimenting across the country with micro transit. Uh, the very same technology that has made Uber and Lyft, you know, <laughs> incredibly valuable companies allows us to rethink transit in the way that we've traditionally thought about it. Uh, we saw proposals for uh, what are essentially vans that can be called on demand uh, for shared rides at very low cost. Um, there are ways to actually subsidize those systems to make them affordable. Um, and there are all different relatively low cost uh, solutions that are somewhere between an automobile and the more traditional ways that we think about transit. So I would, first of all, just say, I would, I would encourage you to really get creative and look around the country and even around the world at some of the more interesting uh, sort of new forms of transit that are, that are coming together. I would also say, you know, you're not going to solve this problem, particularly when you have families spending almost a third of their income on transportation already in this region without, without taking on transportation. The, the caution I would have is that if you think about trans, uh, transportation without thinking about the land use that goes with it, the risk is actually that you're going to exacerbate the problem rather than, than make it better. You asked, you know, are there, uh, is there evidence that you kind of, transit creates a market of incentive for affordable housing? It's actually generally the opposite, that when you have a transit stop or you put in cheaper ways of, of moving around, you're actually creating higher land value and increasing housing costs. And so what you have to do is think very strategically about how you're planning that transit and how the zoning um, and other planning elements go together with it. When done right, it, yes, it can lead to affordable housing, using zoning incentives, using other things. But if not done in concert, where you're very carefully planning transportation, housing, and other land use, you have risks that you're actually going to raise costs rather than lower them. And I think a fundamental issue for we Americans is just the notion of density. We have an idea of what quality housing is in this country, and it's based on a historical narrative that is not sustainable. Everybody wants a house and an acre of land. Um, that is not sustainable. That cannot be our future. That cannot be the future of the planet. Because the problem is, in other parts of the world where there is growing wealth, so upper middle class Indians now want the American dream. They want houses in suburban New Delhi with a half acre lot. And a, well, there's you know 1.2 billion people in that country. They can't all have a house with the backyard. I mean, now, it's true, most of them are poor, but even the ones who are middle class, there's 350 million of them. They, they can't all have, everybody on this planet can't have that I, American ideal of what our notion of quality shelter looks like. And we Americans can't have that either going forward. And it's something that we have to be honest with ourselves about. So the notion of density if we want the planet to be sustainable, sure, we can have it now, but if we want to have it here for our children and grandchildren, we're gonna to have to get comfortable with higher levels of density because with density also comes opportunity to house more people, quality housing, and to solve the transportation problem at the same time. I would also say, you know, uh, I, I think about my teenagers, and I think that American ideal is actually changing, too. That people, particularly millennials, are, are rediscovering the city. You know, I, I went to my godson's wedding uh, a few months back in Birmingham, Alabama. He and his wife were moving into a 400 square foot apartment in downtown Birmingham, right next to a spectacular new park 
developed on the site of an old steel mill. And I looked at my college buddy, uh, his father, a 400 square foot apartment in Birmingham, Alabama? Who would have ever thought they'd be building those, right? They're sold out. So I, I really do think it's not just that we can't do this, but that there are uh, benefits to the diversity, to the walkability, to all of the things that come with that density that with all the other changes that we've seen in our society are, are really beginning to change as well. One more question from Steve's side, and then I have a final one, and, and then we'll move to audience questions. So uh, this region has doubled its population in the last 15 years, and there's a problem with scaling. Uh, are there other regions, maybe not Austin, that we can look to uh, as examples of a region who were able to change their planning as they scaled, uh, connecting, as you say, uh, land use with transit, with housing, and with, with particularly with affordable housing in mind. Um, so, uh, to be frank, I'd, I've never seen the perfect community. On this. There's no, there's no one city. I would say now that's the place you got to go and and look at. But I think there are very good uh, examples uh, of communities that have gotten parts of this right. And so maybe the way I'd answer the question is less about, you know, go look at this place or that place, but what are the characteristics of places that, that get this right? So first of all, this goes back to something um, Darren talked about. It is a combination of strong, brave public leadership. Having, if it, whether it's a mayor or council member or you know county executive or whatever the right scale of, of government is, who's willing to stand up and take some risk on this and to really lead. But I've also seen that when you have a strong set of civic institutions, um, a, a community foundation, a hospital, a university that is willing to really step up and, and lead on this and think about that this is their community and, and it's not just the borders of the school or the hospital, but it is their community and that they owe something back to that community and want to help lead. Those tend to lead to the planning processes that get this right. And then I think it is really, it goes back to something I said before, um, harnessing the success of uh, economically and taking some brave steps to create a mechanism that really dedicates money towards the transportation and the housing solutions uh, that you need. Those elements, I think, are the ones that, that tend to lead uh, to success. And, and without it, um, you know, I think you see a lot of, in Silicon Valley right now, another good example, uh, you know, I think there's an existential threat to the success of our economy and, that, and to that industry because there isn't the political leadership and the alignment around solving the, the commuting and the, uh, the housing and the density challenges. So uh, there are plenty of examples where it's not working as well, unfortunately. Yeah, so there are plenty of examples to learn from, yes. right? And so, so what we can tell you is what not to do for sure. No, seriously. I mean, the reality is there are many places that are held out as iconic because around the world you say the name and people know what you're talking about. So Sean and I spent time in Silicon Valley and I spend a lot of time out there working with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. You do not want to be Silicon Valley. You actually do not want to be Silicon Valley. It is shocking, shocking how selfish, how atomized, how the capacity to think beyond a little bubble of Palo Alto or Menlo Park, for them to think holistically about the valley and say, we, the valley has a problem. All of us have to engage in solving that problem. Palo Alto, just through a, a remarkable amount of 
organized NIMBYism. Shocking. I mean, it, I, I, am, I am almost speechless because, Highly organized. I mean, it, it was, it, but it was amazing to me because what they organized against was the expansion of a private girls' school. This was, this was, the, this is the school in Palo Alto that is the, 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 I mean, first of all, Palo Alto public schools are great schools, but this is the elite school for, for wealthy families to send their daughters to in Palo Alto. And there was so much organized opposition that they ensured that the school was denied a permit to expand, to build a gym. To build a gym. Now, imagine if you were saying, let's build Alice Workforce Housing. So the, the, what, is, what is both shocking, depressing, and appalling is you have this liberal, progressive set of little municipalities who, when called on their progressive ideology, show who they really are because they are not willing to engage in the kind of conversation you are having here. They are not willing to say, who do we want to be? They're willing to say, we've got a problem, but it's the next municipalities to solve this region's problem because I'm not going to change our low density, beautiful Northern California designed per perfect communities. We don't want multifamily housing. And so nobody who works in Palo Alto or Menlo Park or any of these places, and when I mean nobody, I mean real people, not the people who are making six and seven figure incomes. Real people cannot live in any of these towns. And they have to, they have now, they're now on the other side of Oakland. Two hours away is where the average worker who is working in this community commutes from. That's their commute time, one way. And so you don't want to be them. And the fact that you are taking the action that you're taking is a part of, when I talk about courage, the courage that public leaders, philanthropy, average everyday citizens have to take I'm really, really proud that it's happening here. I know it's not perfect. I know you have challenges. I know it's um, not all that you want it to be for everybody, but I think you're on a much better course for the future. Can I say just one other thing um, on that? I, I think the thing you want to make sure not to learn from other places, and I don't mean what places are doing it badly, but the thing that nobody else can teach you is what it is about this place that is uniquely the thing you want to preserve and, and enhance. And I think the maybe this is a learning from other places, but the best planning that I've seen really understands what is unique about a place. And whether it's, you know, we... we, we we had an effort to invest in something called sustainable communities at the beginning of the Obama administration from HUD that was the biggest investment in community planning that uh, the federal government had made in a generation. And we worked with communities in Appalachia that were incredible cultural. Mm -hmm. And they understood they had a unique access to a musical history that was different from anywhere else in the world. Um, and they focused on that. Um, so. That is true when we built the High Line in New York City. I don't know how many people have visited the High Line. When I was HUD secretary, you know, every mayor said, how do I get a High Line? <laughs> My answer was, well, you actually don't want a High Line because that was an industrial rail that ran through New York City that was completely unique. You want to think about what is the unique thing, and it's never going to be called the High Line. You're going to call it something else if you get it right. So that's part of what I think in some ways you can learn to not learn from other communities. And building a consensus around that, getting the different voices that we talked about, 
to have a shared vision of what, uh, what is special about this community and what you want to build on, that's a really important part of getting this right as well. Last question, and then again, we will turn to the audience for further uh, audience questions. I'm here in part representing the students of our school and who are over there to your right. And uh, you've said many, I think, significant uh, things that hopefully are of impact upon them. But if you were to offer now advice, they're now moving into housing design, not just for this semester, hopefully uh, to go into professional practice and other areas with, can you offer further advice to them, what will assist them going into this uh, area of practice and advocacy? Go work for Darren Walker. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so silly. So I would just say that, so I see everything from the standpoint of justice in the world. And there is nothing more fundamental to our ideals of justice, which are at the core about human dignity than the roof over their heads. The quality of life for people is a function of the built environment in which they live. And the people who determine the built environment are you, are the, the schools, like the School of Architecture, who in some ways, the same way lawyers, for better or worse, Lawyers define how we understand our, our codified engagement with each other as a society through the rule of law. You all will be defining how we understand we live. We live as a community. Do we live as a community that is more inclusive, where there is more opportunity? Or are you going to spend your time building walls, building walls like architects and designers do in many parts of the world. So if you go to many parts of the world and you talk about housing, people are talking about how they build walls and how they create all sorts of mechanisms for security that can keep the people who are privileged enough to be secure, safe. Um, we don't want to live in a society like that. And so we need the innovation that comes from young people in schools like your architecture and design school who are going to develop the innovations, develop the ideas, and execute and dazzle us about the possibilities. I would just give you uh, two smaller pieces of advice than that. One is um, I think a lot of young people spend a ton of time thinking about the issue that they want to work on, housing, transportation, and I think that's enormously important. I think one of the most important things as you get out of school is thinking about the way you want to engage um, in your work. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, I went to architecture school, never thought I would end up in government. I went to the Kennedy School of Government, for God's sakes, and got a degree and didn't think about going into government. Um, but what I figured out pretty quickly is that I was not the person who was going to spend my entire career at a community development organization uh, working very deeply and directly uh, in a relatively small uh, area or neighborhood. Um, I wanted to work on the big systems. I wanted to work in a, uh, in a way with, with a large group of people and try to move the, the much bigger systems. And partly I figured out I was a malignant optimist, that I could actually deal with that crazy bureaucracy and, you know, having a hundred different... Uh, senators and 400 and whatever members of Congress as, as constituents. And I, I figured out that that was the kind of place where I could make a difference. And so I would suggest to you it's both understanding what Darren said about the issues you want to move, how you want to change the built environment, but also what scale 
you're really, you personally are meant to work at. And there's no right or wrong answer. People can do brilliant things and make all the difference on a block. Um, or you can make a difference working on, you know, federal policy as well, as crazy as that uh, can be. And that, that leads to my second thing, which is, um, you know, public service. Thank you, Darren, for the um, strong words earlier. Um, you know, we are making public servants the enemy, and how crazy is that? I mean, our founders said, our government is us, right? We, it has to be a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And if people don't get involved in our government, um, whether it's volunteering on your local community uh, for meetings or the school board or actually serving in government, one of the best ways to actually design our communities is to get into government. And so I would urge you to at least give that a chance at some point in your career um, as, a, as a noble cause for designers. Thank you for that. We have some time set aside for uh, questions. I have a microphone that's available to move around. When you do ask a question, if you could first identify yourself uh, so that we're in a little bit more personal uh, discussion. So we'll start with John and, and then John Anderson, and then I'll, uh, we'll move through the audience. Well, I'm, I'm still John Anderson, so. Um, question for Mr. Donovan, through the lens of, of um, of what I thought was a really poignant point about uh, the lens of justice and inequity. Uh, you've been in a position where you can see things going on around the country and track larger trends in housing and the built environment. And I think one of the institutions and in the silos that's probably most resistant or even allergic to ideas about justice are the state DOT uh, apparatus. So, uh, and if you can't tell us about some states that are doing great and innovative things, could you maybe describe how they might catch that virus? Um, so, I don't think it's totally bleak on that front. Um, and I think you can certainly look at a few states, but also cities who are actively engaged in thinking about transportation as an instrument of, of justice. Um, my deputy secretary, when I was uh, first started at HUD, was this guy named Ron Sims, who'd been the county executive, essentially the mayor of King County, one of the biggest counties in the, in the country. And they literally had a transportation plan that was connected to health in a whole bunch of, uh, of different ways and focused on um, getting into com communities that had traditionally been, been left behind. And I think that's, that King County model um, is a really good one for uh, bringing that, that lens. Um, I was just, in this Bloomberg panel, really taken with an idea um, that Boston came up with where they've instituted something called 311, which is now a lot of big cities have done. It's a central call number where you can call in and basically get information, but also give feedback to government on just about anything. I got a pothole on my street, right? This street light is out. What? And it's become a really powerful way to have real-time information about what's happening in the city. Turns out that the number of complaints they get from a community maps perfectly with the income of that community. Not that surprising. So they are literally, um, in the, the grant they were applying for was to put a, a lens on top of that that would say, let's look explicitly at income and equity in the decisions we make about which potholes we're going to fill and how we respond to that. It's not that we're going to ignore the complaints that we're getting, but we're gonna look at that data in addition to uh, other data that we have about uh, who, who is unlikely to call and what the condition, have to find other ways to get information about those streets and the, and the quality. So, so that's an example where you've got an explicit lens of equity. And I think what it takes 
is a leader who is willing to say, this is important to me and we're gonna figure out um, ways to do it. Can I just say something about, and I'm gonna be really snarky, but so as a New Yorker, as, an, as a person who uh, lives in a city that is um, full of remarkable innovation, and certainly we never had a more innovative housing commissioner than Sean, uh, the, I actually do not think that much of the innovation or much of what happens on the East or West Coast is relevant to much of America. And what I mean by that is, is you do not need to wait for Boston or San Francisco for a good idea. The ability to generate what works for your community needs to be generated by you. And it is important to understand the evidence that exists on whatever the domain may be. But you gotta figure out what works for you. And you have to figure out a way to talk about equity in a way that works for your community. And it's one of the things that we institutions, so my institution has certainly learned this, right? So, so we talk about criminal justice in a particular kind of Ford Foundation way. I'll just say that. We can't talk about criminal justice in that way in parishes in Louisiana because that's culturally the way we talk about it and the way we innovate around it is not gonna play. But there are people in parishes in Louisiana who know their criminal justice system is wrong and that it needs to be fixed, it's broken. But they have to come up with the ways of, again, thinking about what works outside of their part of the world. But, and so that's why it's so important to have self-generated, authentic engagement and leadership on these issues because nobody from New York or Boston or San Francisco is gonna solve your challenges. Only you are gonna do that. And only, what, only if you are committed to a basic set of ideas of fairness and opportunity and what you want the future of this region to be, are you not going to end up being Palo Alto? We have a question down here. Yes, uh, my, my question has to do with your mentioning transportation and housing and going on from there and, and uh, education. But I'm, I'm Bob Duffy, I teach at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, the Architecture College. What I'm interested in having you address, if you will, is that I, from time to time I've looked around in this room and there aren't any people of color to speak of whatsoever except perhaps Mr. Walker. Uh, I would suggest that we need to know how people who live in crappy housing, how people who have to take the bus two hours to get to a job in a nursing home, caring for the people that we don't care for, how children who go to crummy schools, how people who can't afford even basic affordable housing. I think it is incumbent upon the academy and the profession to recruit with all our hearts and very seriously and not in a, in a, in a kind of uh, uh, prissy, politically correct way, but to really find people who have experience in these, in these problems that we want to address, the better to solve them. Thank you. It's not a question really, but you can turn it into one. Can I say amen? <laughs> amen. I will just say that I think it is, uh, it is not an indication that, um, how do I put this? When you don't see any people of color in the room, it doesn't mean that white people don't care. It, 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 it means that a community has a set of norms and histories and practices and standards. It's why the lady in Harlem, who had never been to a community board meeting, because I said, why haven't you been to a community board meeting before? I've never seen you, and now you turn up to stop this supermarket. Her answer was, she didn't feel welcomed. 
No one ever asked her to come to a community board meeting. And just simply putting out a flyer saying, community board, it's your community board, turn up, wasn't good enough to get her to turn out. And so the places where I have seen it work, where you actually get authentic, diverse representation at the table Sean talked about, took intentional engagement. It took, there was intentionality on the part of the organizers to say, this table won't be successful if everybody looks the same or if everybody has similar backgrounds. And so let us, let us construct the table in a way that can ensure greater legitimacy when the ideas or the recommendations of this body come forth so that everybody or more people in the community can say, well, at least Joe, who I know from my church, was on the planning committee and he, but if, you, but if nobody sees anybody who looks like Joe or their friends at their church, and then this body comes forward and says, here's what we're gonna do from a planning standpoint, you're probably not gonna be legitimate the outcome with those communities. Can, can I add one thing to that too, is that um, part of the way I think these efforts fail is that they are transactional in the sense that we have a plan we want to get done. We're going to go build a diverse table to get that plan done. And that usually doesn't work because there isn't the trust that's necessary to have those hard conversations. And so one of the things that we were always looking for when we were doing the sustainable communities and a lot of the other planning work that we would do with communities is are there existing relationships and tables that have legitimacy? And so I think you've got to think about this not just as we have a plan we want to get done, let's build, but from a longer term, how do we build these relationships in ways that we're going to work on lots of stuff together, but the, the, the goal here is not the plan or the transaction. It is building the relationship and maintaining that relationship so that it can be a valuable tool for many different uh, manifestations. Hi, uh, Matt Hoffman. I'm a planning commissioner with the city of Fayetteville. Um, Public servant. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to Northwest Arkansas. Thank you for being here. Um, my question actually has to do with education and specifically uh, K-12 education. There's a kind of a, a strange correlation between uh, good public schools and neighborhoods that, that aren't, shall we say, the best development pattern. Um, you know, Mr. Donovan, you talked about sprawl. Um, what are some of the levers that we as architects and designers and developers can pull uh, to hopefully sort of change that paradigm? And do you mean change the education broadly or do you mean to get, to educate kids and get them engaged in these ki the kind of issues that we're talking about here? I'm, I mean specifically in, in terms of uh, getting great schools in more vibrant, urban, dense communities um, and, and that being yet another driver alongside the economic, along, alongside the sort of lifestyle development stuff that we've been talking about. You know, uh, we, we hear from a lot of, in, on the Planning Commission, we hear from a lot of, you know, people that, that want to buy great houses, but they end up going into neighborhoods with development patterns that aren't ideal because the schools are so good. Uh, I, I was the housing secretary, not the education secretary. <laughs> no, look, I think the, um, the education, uh, as our friends at the Walton Family Foundation know, is probably the most confounding public policy challenge facing America. And it is in so many ways a a function of a number of things. First, every parent has a right to want the best for their children. And that manifests 
in certain outcomes. And those outcomes can produce and reproduce disadvantage and privilege. And until we are able to really engage on some of those core issues of can our children go to school together, it is going to be very hard to imagine how our schools can become better. But I don't think that we need to wait to, um, to have a racial class kumbaya. I think there are examples of ways in which we have to innovate in our public schools. And we're seeing some of that with some of the work of the Walton Family Foundation. And there are other ways in which public schools are innovating, and those lessons are really replicable. And so I think that we, we know, again, I, I probably sound like the person who's not giving any solutions, but telling us what we don't want to. I mean, I'm a big Detroit person. I, I, I love the city of Detroit. It is an amazing city. But there is no doubt in my mind that Detroit was cut from the Amazon list of potential candidate cities for their new headquarters because of the state of the public schools. Because there is no way a city, a company like Amazon is going to relocate thousands of people to a city with public schools in the shape of Detroit's public schools. And so we have to invest, and in Detroit, they are turning the corner from what was a horrific period when I think with new leadership and new investment and different innovations occurring in the schools where there is a possibility that the, that school system is going to be turned around. But that's the work of a generation. I say all that to say that I do believe that it is possible for us to significantly improve the state of public schools. We don't, we don't have to create what I fear some believe we do need to create, which is an alternative universe of private schools that, that only mimic, again, as someone who works a lot internationally, what I worry about in my, my country, what I worry about is that I can see the future because I travel to it all the time. I spend time in what used to be called third world countries where rich people live behind walls, where their kids live in an alternative universe in terms of the private academies, the ways in which they are segregated from the life of 99% of the rest of kids in their, their country. I know that world, and that world can't be ours. So we have to figure this out, and the education piece is critical to figuring this out. And we can do it. There are solutions. Perhaps with a that final exclamation point emphasizing education that we can draw this uh, afternoon to a close. I'm gonna ask for a round of applause for both Sean Donovan and for Darren Walker. Thank you. Some seats. And as we close, I, actually, I don't have a benediction <laughs> other than a recommendation. As I mentioned at the outset, not only are we engaged in a design studio and a symposium and a competition, uh, this symposium begins today with these inspiring words and even instruction, instructive words, but it continues tomorrow. It continues in uh, Fayetteville on the campus of the University of Arkansas uh, at the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design. Uh, we have a fantastic array of speakers and presenters. If I could have that slide, please. It's two forward. There we are. 
John Anderson, Ali Solis, Kurt Krieger, Lisa Sturdivant, Esther Yang from Detroit, uh, <laughs> Garner Stoll, and uh, Stephen Luoni and Matthew Petty, uh, all to speak during the day tomorrow, all to engage in panel discussions with community stakeholders, all to engage in much longer and deeper dialogue with our audience. Uh, there are maps on the uh, table as you exit that will assist you, directing you to the Garland Street Garage where parking is free all day on campus, and also then to direct you from the garage uh, into the center of campus into Vol Walker Hall. If you have not visited our school in the middle of campus, it's important to note that Vol Walker Hall and the Stephen L. Anderson Design Center were awarded the 2018 AIA National Honor Award in Architecture. Uh, this is only one of nine buildings to be so recognized this year by the AIA, and it's only one of six School of Architecture buildings ever to be so recognized. One of them is, in fact, at Harvard, the other one at Yale, but nonetheless, uh, this is a signal accomplishment for the school, the university, the region, and it is entirely due to the efforts of Marlon Blackwell Architects and Polk Stanley Wilcox Architects. Mr. Blackwell, I hope, is still in the room and deserves a round of applause. <laughs> the building itself is well worth your visit, and we'll certainly have all uh, spaces available. The symposium tomorrow, its speakers, the discussions, the dialogue, also well worth your visit. I invite you all there. Uh, we begin at 9.30 with coffee. 10 a.m. for a welcome and introduction, uh, introductory remarks, and we'll conclude approximately 4.15. So those of you who have uh, invested in the Super Bowl can uh, uh, partake of that. Uh, right now, however, I'll encourage further informal discussion and dialogue. We've got refreshments over here to my right. I wish you all a good evening and look forward to seeing you all back in Fayetteville tomorrow for the full day of symposium. Thank you again. Thank you.